Well, good afternoon, everybody. I am Catherine Boyle from Key Ministry. I'm joined by my colleague, Beth Golick from Key Ministry. Thanks so much for joining our, joining our monthly video roundtable. Um, this is a discussion, not uh, a webinar. So we look forward to um, the information that is gonna be shared. And I'll just kick it off. I mean, our topic today is about women on the spectrum and helping uh, women on the spectrum get plugged in and find community within church. Um, you know, it's easy to think of autism only in terms of what you see in boys and young men. It may be kind of different for girls on the spectrum. And I thought that might be a place to kind of start in case um, this is unfamiliar territory for anybody who's joining this or, or watching the recording later. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the ratio is still about four to one, boys versus girls or, or men versus women being diagnosed. And again, the presentation can be somewhat different. Um, I'm going to read from a, a blog called, um, well, it's, it's a website called The Art of Autism. And we'll share the links to anything that we mention um, in the show notes. Uh, but this is uh, called Females and Autism slash Asperger's, a checklist. And so this is, this is from somebody who I believe is on the spectrum, but I thought it was a pretty good list. And so some of the things that you may see in a young woman who is on the spectrum is that they may be very deep thinkers, um, you know, very intelligent, very analytical, very serious, but at the same time, they may be very innocent and, and naive and maybe taken advantage of easily um, uh, on the positive end of that, you know, they may have a difficult time with lying, which is great. Um, you know, they may be overwhelmed by uh, friendships and conversations. Um, so they might, you know, kind of escape into their own thoughts or uh, into, into behaviors that other people don't typically engage in, um, like maybe obsessively collecting objects or organizing objects. Um, you know, they may have a lot of what are called comorbid conditions where in addition to having autism, they also have been diagnosed with OCD or with anxiety or with depression. Um, interest interestingly, eating disorders are something that is very common to see in women with autism. Then like boys or men, you know, the social interaction is a little bit off. Um, they may have a difficult time making friends. Um, they may have been the kid who always raised her hand in class and, and or spoke out of turn in class when they were growing up. Um, and, you know, some of the, their social interactions, you know, they can be great at imitating, but, you know, they, they don't always use what they have learned appropriately. Um, you know, they may be the person that you think of when you hear the word quirky. Uh, and they can find refuge when they're alone. Uh, so it's not uncommon that they would be loners and, and looking for a way to plug in. And then um, just a couple other things, you know, they're typically really sensitive, like boys on the spectrum. They can be very sensitive to sounds or textures or temperatures or smells. Um, so Anyway, those are just a few things. It's a, it's a much longer list. I'm just kind of, you know, scrolling through here to pull out some of the highlights, but um, just knowing a little bit then about what a woman on the spectrum is experiencing, um, I think can be really helpful towards understanding how to reach connection. I mean, like boys, you know, women tend to share to make connection and it can seem, you know, like that monopoly monopolization of the conversation um, is narcissistic or self-centered, but it's really just the way that they're trying to connect. So, so I don't sound like a narcissist here. Um, this is not a monologue, but you know, I would love to hear any insights or approaches that you have used that we can all benefit from, you know, for women in your churches and your communities who are on the spectrum. Feel free to just go ahead and speak or raise your hand and we'll-, we'll Sylvia continue. has her hand up. <laughs> Sylvia. It, this is almost embarrassing, but it's also 
very enlightening that we would have this conversation today. Um, I think many women, young ladies who may be on the spectrum may not recognize that they're on the spectrum. And I say that this is embarrassing and this, this may be very comical as well. Um, I had a major meltdown on Sunday, Saturday night. Never have been diagnosed as being on anybody's spectrum, but it felt like it on Saturday night when I felt like my whole schedule and my whole life and everything that I've been going through for the last 18 months was caving in on me. And I had to call a friend of mine to really talk me through it and talk me down off of the wall. Because what was happening on Saturday, Saturday, Sunday was we were, we've had a tent revival at church for the last three days, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of last week was a tent revival. So Sunday would have been our first day back kind of in person, but not in church because we had a 2000 seat tent put up outside, which I knew I wasn't going to, but because I'm doing Sunday school class um, for the three classes that I have for special needs children. But it hit me on Saturday night that my whole schedule and my whole life was going to be different as of Saturday, Sunday morning. It meant I, because of, I wasn't aware that an email had been sent out, but we weren't going to have the Digging and Ministry prayer call at eight o'clock like we normally do. Service times were changed from 8, 10, and 12 to 9 and 11.30. I no longer would be going to church to set up a Sunday school classroom. There would not, not be a 6.30 service any longer. It was all of those things that finally hit me on Saturday night. And I'm telling you, I had a major meltdown. That's all I'm going to say. Well, you know, regardless of, you know, if, if and where any of us are on the spectrum, can we just take a minute to acknowledge the chaos and some of the grief that has gone on in our lives as a result of, you know, for those of us who work in a church ministry and, you know, things stopped very suddenly and then depending where you are in the country, things, you know, maybe have resumed, um, you know, in addition to being with Key Ministry, I do work in a church. I'm actually here right now and I love what I do. I love my job. I love the people. I love, you know, being able to share Jesus with them. But let me tell you, when we went from being at home and then suddenly coming back and having to work in person every Sunday morning, you know, at the crack of dawn, there was a little bit of a grieving process, I have to admit, even though I, you know, I'm so happy to be back. But um, let's not just gloss over that. I mean, that's not really the topic necessarily of this conversation, but that's a real thing. Um, you know, it's, it, there's, there's been a lot of stress in ministry over these last, you know, this last year and a half. Does anybody else want to speak to that? Is, does anybody else feel that? Have you felt that in the last year and a half? Hi, Beth, um, and everyone. This is Janet. Janet. Um, <laughs> thank you all um, for um, this opportunity. And uh, I just want to share, you know, that as a parent, um, of a son and a recent diagnosed daughter uh, on the spectrum and myself working in ministry for many years, um, you know, we just recently opened back up. And so um, not at full capacity, uh, but um, thank you um, 
uh, Sylvia, for sharing your story. Um, for me, um, I think that my, my son handled going back um, a lot better than my daughter did. Um, for my daughter, um, as we drove up into the parking lot, she began to experience some anxiety. Um, and I asked her, you know, well, what, what, what's wrong? Are you okay? And my daughter just turned 16. And, uh, and, and she said, well, she said, I'm just, I don't know, you know, I don't want anybody, uh, to, cause like I said, she was just recently diagnosed to be looking at me or, you know, and I said, well, babe, honey, nobody knows, um, you know, that you've been, I've not shared it. Um, with uh, anyone at the church and you're fine, we're, we're going to be okay. I say, well, what do you want to do? What, what is it that you want to do? And she shared with me, well, I just want to go back home. And so I, I took her home um, because that was what she wanted. I wanted to make her feel comfortable. And I told her, I said, when you're ready, uh, just let me know and, uh, and we'll go together. But for today, you know, we'll continue watching service online. And, but when you're ready, let me know. So it has impacted uh, my family in ways that it hasn't ever before. Um, and so, you know, I, I just want to share that, um, you know, and, and not just my professional role um, of working um, and, 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 and just communicating and, and sharing um, with autistics, you know, in my own home, um, um, I find that it has been very, very challenging uh, during this time. So um, thank you all for allowing me to share that. You know, I, I just, you know, when I come to this meeting, I come as a parent. Uh, I don't want to appear to come as a professional. Um, yes, I work for Autism Speaks, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian and I'm an advocate, you know, and a parent first and foremost, more than anything. And I just want to add that what happened to me helped me to realize and to really truly be more sensitive to what's happening to our individuals, what's happening within our families, and everybody that's connected, that we have to increase our level of sensitivity about what's going on. And like Janet says, it's it's not about what we need at the time it's a what it's about what they need at the time and how can we support them and how can we engage and connect with their feelings um because mine was real it it was truly real and reaching out to my friend was a way for me to again become grounded and i you know, we'll be celebrating my 70th birthday on Saturday. So I have sense enough to know that this is what I need, you know, but young people like a 16 year old may not know that that's what they, they need. And I've been working with individuals and families with disabilities for over 40 years. So it's, it's new for me. It's a, you know, of becoming attached to where I am in life and space and, and who, I, who I connect with every day. Sylvia, I love how God kind of worked through that, that experience that you had to then give you that better understanding of what others are going through. That's very cool. I wanted to say too that that um, we've noticed with our Amy, we've had to be especially sensitive to where she's coming from each Sunday, literally every Sunday. Do I want to go? Do I want to be there? Now, Amy has something called CHARGE syndrome, C-H-A-R-G-E, but with it often comes a dual diagnosis of autism. So we have denied that in our own hearts and heads, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we see it every day. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, a mild version, I would think, but still, you know, those things are there. She has some obsessions and she has some anxiety that might not be there if she didn't have charge slash autism. So um, we are working every, every season in her life on how to help her to fit in. Also because she has charge syndrome, but because she has the, the, those autistic tendencies as well. We also have a young woman in our affinity life group on Sunday mornings who is 19. Now she comes from a family um, that uh, we've mentioned them before. There's six members of the family and four of them have autism. 
dad and three of the kids. And this is one of them. Um, her, her older sister is very much affected and has to go to special needs class or disability class. But Heidi does not, um, and she wouldn't mind me sharing this with you. So that's why I don't mind saying her name. Um, but she, they're a very open family. Yeah. But she struggles, we can see, with trying to fit, where am I going to fit? And so she has found a, a niche, I think, in our class. So her mom and dad are there. Her whole family comes except for the daughter that needs to be in special care. So it has been our blessing to get to know her and to appreciate her struggles. So she has trouble with communicate, articulating words out of her mouth. We know that she's highly intelligent, but she has a hard time communicating those things. Uh, but we sense that she feels like she, she can be comfortable with us and in our class. And there's not just autistic people in there. There's not just people with special needs and not even associated with special needs, all of us, but they, um, they, the other members of the class are getting to know her as a person. And I think that's the biggest deal for Janet, your 16 year old and for, um, Sylvia and other people that are struggling with different things, you know, let's, and, and we, I'm preaching to the choir here. I know that, but, but the message is we're all individuals and we all are, are, uh, uh, full of abilities. And so let's focus on those and get to know the sweet spirits of all of these young women that come into our lives or that are constantly <laughs> in their lives, like Amy every day, all day long. So yeah, I, I appreciate Janet and Sylvia both, what you both have appreciated, what you have shared, because it gives us insight that we all need. Right, and yeah, one other thing just to add to that. Uh, there was a time in the class where Heidi uh, shared something and she, it, it was a long amount of sharing, but she struggled with every word. And just to have the sensitivity afterwards to, to just affirm her that what she was doing is, um, is, it was great just to be part of the discussion. And she just needs a little bit, uh, a little bit of encouragement. So just to It was very to courageous that. Yeah, of her she, to do she that. Did a great you job. can tell that it, she was a little fearful, but then she just pushed it through and it takes her a long time to get the words out, but she just, she got them out and she knows that she's accepted. So we affirm that, yes. I think uh, you raised a really interesting point there uh, because people on the spectrum often relate much better to people who are older or younger than them. And I mean, this is a great example where maybe it doesn't really matter where a person who's a young adult plugs in to a group, you know, it, when they find a friendship and, you know, connection, you know, maybe that's the solution versus trying to make them fit into an aged match group, you know, they may not fit with, with people who are their age. I'll just tell you a little personal thing. You know, I think most of you, all of you know, I have a, a young adult son who's um, has high functioning autism. He's going to graduate from college here in a few months. Yay. Um, very smart kid. But when I was, we were at a time when he had not been diagnosed, he was a teenager, he was going through some things and I was just praying, you know, God, what do I do? You know, what, what is the right solution here? Because, you know, it's very easy for people who don't have a diagnosis or, or, you know, somebody looking on the outside to be very judgmental and think that, oh, well, you know, that's bad parenting. That's uh, just a, a kid who's a, a problem, whatever. And that's still small voice of God that I recognize when I hear it said to me, you need to love him. Nothing else. You know, that was, that was the answer that I got. And I was like, whoa, you know, that was, you know, it was like Jesus, you know, what is it A, B, A or B? And he pulls a coin out of a fish. It's C, right? And I think that um, that third option C that maybe, you know, we don't necessarily think is in view is, is what the solution is. And, and it's not as, it's not complex. You know, it's, it's, it's like Sylvia said, you know, it's stepping into another person's experience and being able to see it from their view and what that opens up to you. I mean, it's, it can be really um, transformative for you and also for, for them. All right, so somebody else. 
My internet was a little glitchy a minute ago. So if you had your hand up, I didn't see it. Barb. I think we just need to acknowledge that there are a lot of women who are on the spectrum or are on what I call living in the borderland, but you're talking about with your son, which we have some of that at our house too, um, where you don't have a diagnosis because maybe you don't have enough traits to officially get the diagnosis, but you feel different. I think there are a lot, especially of women and girls who don't have the diagnosis, but have some traits. And what I think is really helpful is helping them to understand, to be aware of their own needs and be okay with their needs are different instead of trying to make themselves fit in with everyone else. So, I mean, I'll just speak on my own behalf. I don't have an autism diagnosis, but um, there is autism all over my family. Like you throw a rock, you're gonna hit somebody that has some kind of autism. And I have many traits myself. I have sensory processing. I have uh, trouble visualizing things, all kinds of things that if you look it up, I think like, what's that quirk I have? Oh, because it's autism, okay. Um, but with that, sometimes you do feel different from um, other groups of people. And so I think it's really just empowering people to love themselves the way they are and know that it's okay if, if their needs are different. I totally agree. And I am right there with you. You know, you don't, I've done those online tests. Mm -hmm. I'm not on the spectrum, but I'm mm -hmm. dang close. And I, I mean, and I think some of you mm -hmm. know, I was anorexic and bulimic when I was in college and a huge percentage of women on the spectrum have anorexia. In fact, mm -hmm. it's, it's become so well known that practitioners will call it the female Asperger's because it's mm -hmm. such a large minority of, of women that have it. So Anyway, it goes along with the, you know, for some people with the texture thing and certainly with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll send a, I'll add the link to um, another article about that because I, when I saw that a few years ago, it just blew me away. Mm -hmm. Like another confirmation. Thank you, Barb. Anybody else? Leanne. Yeah, I'm so grateful for this conversation today. Uh, I, my story is we, uh, my spouse and I have a young adult daughter uh, who's high functioning on the spectrum, um, who's getting married in two weeks. And it was one of the most powerful parts as I'm listening to you um, affirm how important it is to celebrate exactly who that person is in front of you, right? That child, that daughter, that son, that member of your uh, Sunday school class to really celebrate and to, to find ways to connect and validate and empower. When I stopped trying to fix my daughter about oh, six or seven years ago, I had this realization, like, I think I'm trying to get her to somehow fit into what I think her life should be. Um, and when I, when I had this incredible realization, um, it just changed everything for us. She ended up meeting a young man um, who also has his own unique disabilities, but they kind of balance one another in terms of really offering strength to the relationship, but having so much compassion on the other. And I just celebrate, even though our family now, you know, has more disability in some way to think about my husband and I, we have more disability. Communication is difficult, you know, not only between the two of them, but they're really embracing this, these premarital conversations that they're having with a therapist. They're really excited about learning these skills to practice one and with one another. And we are so blessed beyond belief because of disability that has really just opened our hearts to being able to love more like Jesus, frankly. So I just, I marvel at the paradox of this, you know, this thing that people generally think is just a, a nightmare, a disability, and it truly can be so draining and overwhelming if a family is trying to deal with that without enough support. Amen to that. Um, and we need to be there for one another. But this is just such a powerful experience this, this day, you know, just sharing in the conversation. And um, I'm actually, um, it was part of my work as a pastor, uh, working with special needs families, it gave me this wake up call, like, I think you're trying to fix your daughter, Leanne, you know, and as soon as I woke up to that, and I was completely unconscious to it before, I just wanted to be a good mom, not realizing that it was in some way hindering my relationship with her. So. Leanne, thanks for sharing. That's, that's 
powerful stuff. And that makes me want to ask the question, have, do any of you at your churches have examples where you're taking those unique gifts that that individual has, and instead of trying to you know, pigeonhole them into whatever the existing group or the norm is, where they've been able to use their gifts um, in unique ways. Does anybody have any examples of that they could share? Greg. Um, so one of the things that we do at You Belong, this is the church that my wife and I uh, run, is called our Better Together events. And every week we get together. And the idea is to bring people of all abilities together. Um, and what we really did there is we started by saying, you know, we're going to have a first couple of meetings. We'll do a couple of different things, painting, cooking, music, different things that interest, you know, kind of everybody. But then as part of those initial meetings was to ask, what are you passionate about? What are you excited about? What's meaningful for you? And then we just started planning, doing things based on those responses strictly. Um, and so that kind of led us down a really beautiful path and has opened our eyes to, oh, there's some unique things here that people uh, really enjoy doing. And, and from that, really able to see what are some of the gifts here and how do we use that. Um, and so as we're doing some of our church ministries, being able to plug people in uh, that way, because we've identified those gifts by seeing them kind of in action um, through some of these better together gatherings. So that's been really fun just to see, um, particularly like cooking. That's been a really interesting one. Cooking and painting, I think, are two of the bigger ones that have really stood out. Um, our garage now has, um, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. We, you tie a paint can from the ceiling and you cut a hole in the bottom of the paint can and there's a canvas on the ground and it's really easy because all you do is kind of let the paint can go and it makes this really cool design all over the canvas but it's been a great way to just bring people together and make some unique things um, and then cooking especially working with some folks in different group homes uh, who don't do a lot of cooking or haven't really explored that area it's been a great connection um, but, but but then being able to take people from those groups and with some of our food or oriented ministries, being able to plug them in and help them thrive in some of those ministries has been really, really fun to see. That's really cool, Greg. Thanks so much for sharing. So does anybody else have, or Barb, you've got your hand up again, go ahead. Yeah, just really quickly. So I know a couple individuals who, um, don't have official diagnosis, but are kind of in that borderland who have done research. They have used their deep thinking skills to do sermon research, to do missions research, um, and it has just been a fantastic fit. Awesome. Hey, um, before I forget, I think it's in two weeks, we're gonna have the first of three blog posts from this woman named Linda Bunk. Does anybody know her it's on the call? She, she also goes by the handle Abnormal Missionary. Oh my goodness, I love Linda. Linda has um, Asperger's slash high-functioning autism and bipolar disorder, and she is a missionary now with a, a sending organization that does most of their work in Ukraine. She's been to Ukraine now like 25 times at, or maybe more, and she is the most interesting person, and the work that God has provided, has, has enabled her to do is perfect for the way he made her. And I just think this is like the most beautiful, this most beautiful exhibit of what, of how God does not make mistakes the way that he makes us. In, in, in Ukraine and in, in countries that were in, you know, former communist nations, um, mental illness is still absolutely not discussed. It's not treated. There, there are not treatments for it children with disabilities are often placed in orphanages. And so, I mean, it is just a very bleak place still in many ways, but the, the missions work that's going on there, when, when somebody like Linda shows up, oh my goodness, the hope that she has given parents who have children who have disabilities and they're trying to raise them and they're trying to find resources and solutions and you know there ain't much there, Oh my goodness. I mean, what an inspiration and, and, and hope and encouragement she has been to these, these families. And so, and she's a phenomenal photographer. So we're, any, anyway, we're going to have three blog posts from her the next three months. And it will include information about her life, which has been very difficult in many ways, 
but then how God is using exactly how he made her to spread his kingdom and to spread incredible hope and resources to, um, to folks who, you know, who don't really have, you know, the support that we have here. So um, she's, if I didn't say that, she's a phenomenal photographer too. So all the, all the photography will be her own. So be sure to check that out in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And for those of you who are not familiar with our blogs, so Key Ministry actually has two different blogs. So there's the uh, Church for Every Child, which is our ministry blog. And then we do have a parent blog. They're both accessible from keyministry.org. And you can actually subscribe so you get them emailed directly to you. Okay, so what else would you guys like to share? You know, does, does anybody have anything that's established that is taking into account you know, that perhaps unique needs for women on the spectrum or, any, or anything that you'd like to share about this? I have something that we might be trying this year that might be um, helpful to get some um, feedback on if you guys have anything to say. Um, so we have two young women who um, are on the spectrum and they love connecting with just everyone from the church. Um, and so right now they are just take, like, take part in our adult disability class um, on Sunday mornings, but they want to do something on Wednesday nights during our connection. And so um, we have a few older women who have stepped up and said, We'd love to lead like a little group with them, um, mentor them, do some devos with them, talk about life. Um, and in a way, just in integrating them more into um, our church body. But instead of um, having them attend our women's Bible study, that might be a little too challenging for them, um, kind of bringing that to them and bringing it down to their level. Um, so I don't know if anyone's done anything like that in the past or has any um, other ideas that might be helpful. Um, yeah, that we're looking to do to kind of integrate them a little bit more and give them um, a way to, yeah, just be a part of the bigger body. Anybody have any suggestions for Lexi? Thank you so much for sharing that, Lexi. That's, that's wonderful. Yes, Haley. Um, I think something that's really empowering for friends with disabilities is just giving them a role in the church so like yes having a bible study that they can understand and is accessible to them but also like looking at their strengths and giving them a role in the church whether it's like greeting people or praying for people or whatever it is um, connecting with new families I think that's a great way to um, to get people in the church to interact with them and like empower them. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let's see, I saw Leanne first and then Janet. I was, I was just gonna say, um, I know how important it is that there are other adults, not just the parents, right? Or the grandparents who are bringing that individual uh, who may be on the spectrum or who needs a little bit of extra support due to their um, particular vulnerabilities. It needs to be, you know, ordinary other adults who are not part of their family who reach out and say, hey, would you like to do this with me? Or, hey, we could really use some help in the kitchen or how, we, because so often I think parents, grandparents, right? We're advocates tirelessly. And when we go to church, we need some other adults to say, I'm going to show up for your kid because they too are a part of the body of Christ. And I'm not going to just tolerate her, right? And be polite and make space because it's, you know, kind of like, um, oh, you know, it's a, it's almost a, a pity kind of posture, but no, I, to, to say as an adult in the community, I value diversity because I get to see God more clearly when I embrace it and to live from that posture. So it's not sort of a pity thing. You know, I'm doing this to help out that poor person with a disability or that family. I'm doing this to help them. No, I'm doing this so that I can see God more fully in the world by getting to know and getting to embrace someone who might not otherwise find an easy way in. 
So I guess I just wanted to, you know, encourage people to like help name that for the adults in their community. Like you need to take your own voice, your own feet and walk up to that family and go, hey, this is what I'd love to invite you to help me with today. You know, and, and that's so powerful and important. Excellent. Thank you. Now, Janet. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, um, Leanne. One of the things that I want to share, Lexi, um, is that um, uh, at Autism Speaks, we re recently launched a Workplace Inclusion Now. And when I think about Workplace Inclusion Now, I went back and took all of the resources from Workplace Inclusion Now and incorporated them into um, the Blue Blessings um, that I actually champion for Autism Speaks, which is our faith-based initiative. And uh, because, and I've been speaking with churches across the country and encouraging them um, for a lot of people in the autism community, especially women in the autism community, they've lost jobs, you know, and opportunities uh, during this pandemic, they all have, and they've all have suffered tremendously. And so I'm encouraging, you know, churches to make sure that you open up opportunities uh, within your church for those with autism and other intellectual disabilities, or just those that need help and support uh, because uh, most of them are so um, capable, they're capable of doing the job. And I've always felt that if you're capable to do the job, you should get the job. So uh, we know that our churches, a lot of times, a lot of them run as businesses because they have all of these administrative departments and so many different areas in which people can not just be a part, but actually have an opportunity to get an employment opportunity. So Leanne, as you was talking about, you know, having that adult uh, that adult could also be someone else who may be on the spectrum to be able to go out and, and bring others in and help make them feel welcome and support them. Um, so that's just another way uh, of in making sure that you have inclusivity uh, within your ministries and within your churches uh, to make sure that when you're looking, uh, uh, outsourcing those opportunities, that you not overlook uh, those who are on the spectrum uh, because they bring skills that others just a lot of people just don't have and they're very very good at the jobs that they do uh they're very dedicated they show up on time they get the job done and they do stuff uh, a lot of times that other people just don't even want to do so um you know that's just a way of inclusivity that we also need to take a look at and making sure that that sector of diversity is included in our ministries as well excellent Excellent. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I guess, categories of things that we advocate in mental health ministry, you know, at, from key ministry is kind of looking outside the four walls to address community needs that are um, potential, either existing or potential mental health stressors. Because if you can alleviate something that is, is you know, uh, causing a life challenge or contributing to a life challenge, that can mitigate mental health needs. And so, I mean, as an example, my church used to have a, um, it was just a, a group of guys within the church who would repair donated cars and would turn around and, and give them to an individual or family who needed transportation, but, you know, for whatever reason did not have it right now. And oh my goodness, I mean, what an incredible blessing that was. And so like if, if somebody, maybe not women, but maybe some women are, you know, who are skilled mechanics. I mean, that might be a phenomenal way to involve them in something where, you know, it, it can be income producing, not just, um, you know, uh, uh, ministry participation. So just throwing that out there as an example. So anybody else have something that you have underway or just a, a question or a concern or, or anything you'd like to share about, um, how your church has, or how you would like to see church uh, be supporting young women on the spectrum. I will say uh, one of my deepest questions uh, as a Christian for years has been, I'm not quite sure how um, having the best and the brightest, whether you're a singer, whether you're a musician, whether you're a, a public speaker, whether you're, why is it that many of our congregations, especially the wealthier ones who can afford to pay for the best and the brightest, and who maybe live in communities where there's a lot of um, professionally skilled people, 
I'm just not sure what to do with that theologically as a Christian. And, and um, because I've been a part of a church community where people who want to serve, even if they have a stutter, even if they have Tourette syndrome, if they want to speak and say the Lord's Prayer, the whole community waits patiently with them while they get through that Lord's Prayer. And we all celebrate together. Like, I just feel like th there's a disconnect for me when I go to a church and it feels like there's only these really polished professionals who are leading worship. I'm like, where are the people like me and my family? So I just wonder if other people experience that at times as well. And, and maybe like, I don't know how you, how you found a way through. Sorry, Sorry to keep yeah. talking, but that, um, so that is a culture issue and that is a leadership problem. So the way that it really is not based on socioeconomics, although it does a lot of times look that way, but it's really about the leadership. And if they communicate that this is a place where we are all ourselves and it's not about perfection, it's about community, that can happen in any congregation, but it only happens if your leadership champions that and invites the people in that can help um, spread that. I personally think this is a huge hot button issue for me because I only want to go to a church where people can be themselves and when it's too polished and if I feel like someone's going to walk in, they're going to feel like I'm not good enough to be here. I don't want to be at that church. So the more we can change that culture as a community in the big C Christian church, the stronger we will be in empowering people and really connecting them to the heart of worship. So go girl, let's get that. <laughs> I love your soapbox, Barb. <laughs> That's awesome. I also wanted to share that one thing that our pastor has done, he has a real heart for people with disabilities. And he has, Tom just reminded me that he has invited people. There was a young man, um, probably in his 40s, who he's young to me now, <laughs> who um, has Down syndrome and his best buddy had passed away like the year before. And he just asked the pastor if he could pray on that day, if he could pray in the front during the main service. And Jonathan just brought him up and put his arm around him and said, okay, David is going to pray now for us. And it was such a huge deal, I think, for our congregation because what they're seeing is a pastor who cares, a pastor who is authentic, you know, when we were talking about, I think it was Leanne, when you were talking about um, people who are doing ministry just for the sake of doing ministry, and they're not authentically building relationships with people, and we see it all over the place, Amy can smell that a mile away, and she is like not going to engage with that person because she knows intuitively this isn't really honest. And I think that's true for a lot of our friends. So, but Jonathan is 100% authentic with the way that he embraces special needs and disabilities at our church. And I really appreciate that about him because I know when it starts at the top, it trickles down. And that is a good lesson in training for anybody who's under him. And he's got a lot of staff under him. So, and a lot of volunteers under him. So it is a huge blessing to watch that. That's wonderful. Awesome. Anybody else have any, any comment about or question about our topic today or about the whole concept of polished church versus real church? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly how you said it, Julie, but nobody wants to be somebody else's project. You know, I mean, they just don't. I mean, in, in, I mean, you can, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just not the way to be effective in ministry. Does anybody else have a comment? Barb again, go ahead. I'm sorry. I can, but this no. is one of my, this is actually Leanne, one of my favorite subjects, because this is what our church um, that I go to was founded in was this authenticity and the, the being messy. It's messy church a little bit. And, um, I forgot what I was going to say, but um, what was your question? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, let's see, being authentic, uh, not polished church. Um... Oh, I, I know. I think it really just comes with the more people who are 
who are willing to be authentic themselves, the more that culture will change. And um, it does help with the leadership, but it can really start from anywhere. So I think that's that when we don't do that, we're not really connecting people to the true heart of God because your connection with Christ needs to be authentic. If you can't authentically be yourself at church, how are you authentically going to grow? So. And, you know, I mean, Jesus said in Revelation and, and not just there, but that, you know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb, you know, what he does and the word of our testimony, like how he works out stuff in our life. And so, I mean, our own story is personal I and mean, it's got to be real. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we're being honest, if we're not, you know, you, anyway, so I just think that there's so much wrapped up into that authenticity and, and how important that is um, for any church. And, and, and back to the topic at hand, I mean, women who are on the spectrum can be awfully good at camouflaging or hiding to fit in, particularly when they're, they're teens and young adults. And so, you know, just giving them that freedom to not have to put on, you know, a, the, the mask before the mask, you know, that is uh, an incredibly freeing thing for, for anyone, you know, to just be able to, to really be who they are and, and be able to trust that, you know, where, where they are is, um, a place where, you know, not only God sees and hears, but other people can see and accept them like God does. Anything else? We've got about 10 minutes to the top of the hour. Um, all right, Janet first this time and then Leanne. Uh, Catherine, thank you. Um, you know, when you were just talking about um, camouflage and, um, you know, our um, Vice President of Services and Supports, uh, she's on the spectrum, and uh, and she actually wrote an article about women being masters of camouflage, uh, and how um, they also tend to be, you know, can be very um, scripted or overly controlled uh, in, in certain interactions with people, you know, to a point of becoming non-reciprocal with others. And so she just kind of talked about and shared her story of growing up and how challenging it was and how she would do her best to try to, you know, if she was with a subgroup of females, she would do whatever she could to try and mimic their behaviors or try to fit in. But that's not what inclusivity is about. You know, it's about accepting people, you know, accepting your flaws and all, whatever they may be, your challenges, your, you know, your strengths, all of that, it all encompasses who we are. And if we're all honest, you know, we all have some type of disability, you know, and if you, and if you feel like you don't have one, if you live long enough, you will. So we have to be like Jesus. He walked with, you know, those who uh, needed help. You know, miracles were performed um, for those who had disabilities and, and, and needed help and support and challenges. And how dare the church, you know, not feel that or want to hide this group over in a room and feel like, oh, well, yes, we have an inclusive ministry, but they're in the back room on Sundays or on Sabbath or whenever people choose to, you know, have church. But at the same time, you have to bring people to the forefront and let them be their authentic selves to be able to celebrate. And I love, Barb, what you said just about, you know, allowing people just to, to that message church or whatever you want to call it. I understand what that means just to be able to allow people to be their authentic selves. So often, you know, um, a lot of pastors want to make sure that the church is polished and make sure that everybody is singing on the same note and, you know, everything is in order. But, but we know for, especially myself, for a son who can often have outbursts and have been told in the past that I need to take him home or he's disruptive or whatever. Uh, no, I'm not going anywhere. You know, he deserves to be here just like you. And so I'm grateful that he's in my life, but I'm also grateful that I'm in his because I'm going to advocate for him and speak for him when no one else will. So yes, sometimes we have to carve our place out in society and that's okay. But at the end of the day, you know, people need to get on board. Thank you, Janet. That was awesome. All right, and Leanne, do you have something else? I was so caught up in what Janet was saying. I was so moved. It was so powerful. I, I don't think that, I can't even remember what I was going to say. Like, it, <laughs> it doesn't even matter. Like, that was just the perfect way to end our time together. 
Oh, I do remember now. It was yeah. so, 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 so minuscule. But okay, I was just going to say, my husband and I have found so much peace, I think, as parents by watching a couple programs that we've discovered um, on Netflix, maybe. I don't know. I'm not the one who knows those channels really well. But there's a program called The Good Doctor. There's another program called Atypical. And then, of course, there's a new one. Uh, a second season is just beginning, I believe, on Netflix called Love on the Spectrum. And I will say that <clears throat> these programs are all very, very different. But there is so much dignity given to uh, a person's authenticity and the family's journey together and just trying to figure it out in just very, very down to earth kinds of ways, but that are really inspiring too. So I just wanted to name those three programs, but also ask if there were others, other programs I'm not aware of or uh, other resources that people may have. Does anybody else know of other TV shows or movies or documentaries that might be especially insightful? Well, if you do, you know, find out something like that, definitely send it to either me or Beth, because, you know, that kind of thing, we love to be able to, to share, incorporate, you know, is appropriate with the other things that we're doing. So, um, you know, since I do all the social media, you know, I'm constantly on the lookout for things that are helpful for those who follow the work that we do. So thank you very much, Leanne. Catherine, I can get a list from our autism response team and share it with you as well. You betcha, that would be awesome. Janet is a, she is a one woman dynamo. So she's a good person to get to know if you have any questions about the autism world. All right, well, Beth, do you have anything else uh, before we wrap up? Um, no, I just, I wanna thank everybody for being on this today. It seemed like a really timely topic. I, I mean, I feel like this has been a really sweet time of just discussion together and um, so I really appreciate the fact that you all took the time today and thank you for asking the questions and for sharing your experiences. Yes, and I echo that, uh, very much appreciate that. So I think the next thing we have coming up on our events calendar is probably idea share. Is that right, Beth? I think so. And then, yeah, with a whole bunch of stuff happening in October. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, once October comes, you're gonna be busy. Yes, yes, all of you, because you're all going to be joining everything that we do. So, uh, no, definitely check out our events page, and we do hope that you can join us. Um, you know, uh, Idea Share is a roughly a once a month thing now, so uh, we hope that uh, some of you will be able to make that and appreciate all the the face, faithful supporters that we've had uh, for that effort. It's helped all of us tremendously as we've been negotiating uh, this strange new world that we live in. Well, with that, um, it's five till, I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us. And as always, uh, reach out to me and Beth if you have any questions or um, if we can help in any way and we'll see you next time. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Take care, everybody.